Thank you to my Patreons for voting for this subject. If you'd like to vote on future subjects as well as get early access to videos, then check out my Patreon where you can support the channel from as little as just $1 per creation. Oh boy, this disaster is a horror show. Slightly different from my usual atomic related content, but the aftermath of Bhopal gives any nuclear accident a run for its money. Okay, let's go through some background information first. Bhopal is a city of the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh, which is about here on a map. The city's population had grown rapidly between the 1950s and 1980s, from around 60,000 to 800,000. India's 16th largest city is situated 500 metres above sea level, and the area is famous for its surrounding hills, fields and forests. In 1984, the city's municipality covered 285 square kilometres, and due to its location in central India, had become a major communications and transport hub. The old town of Bhopal consisted of tight twisting roads, markets, mosques and the railway junction, mainly inhabited by poorer families. The houses in the area were of two types. Kutcha houses had no doors or windows, and the more permanent Paka houses. Moving south of the old town is the more affluent part of the city, with more modern housing and larger avenues. To the north of the old town is situated the Union Carbide Indian Limited plant, surrounded by working class densely populated slums. The plant was built in 1969 for the purposes of making pesticides derived from concentrates from the US. In 1977, a production plant to make Sevin was established. Sevin was Union Carbide's marketing name for carabile pesticide, created by the company in 1958. Up until 1979, the plant had used imported methyl isocyanate, also known as MIC. However, it was decided that the Bhopal plant would benefit from being able to create its own MIC. The government of India granted the company a license to produce 5,000 tonnes of seven per year, way above the predicted annual sales forecasts of around 2,000 tonnes. However, management in New York sought to boost sales with a higher output and went ahead with a plant boasting capacity close to its licensing restriction rather than actual demand. The increased output of pesticides from the plant did nothing to boost sales, in fact sales reduced, mainly due to local droughts and poor performance of the chemical in the field. By 1982 sales were under half the plant's capacity and by 1984 sales had dropped to a fifth. Because of this Union Carbide set out to make savings the only way a big corporation knows how, by cutting back on staff. The barely broken in MIC plant, which was oversized for demand, struggled to make any kind of profit. The staff cutbacks increased, eventually laying off highly skilled workers. It was also around 1982 that the culture of the plant changed as a safety first and expensive to employ American engineer in charge was replaced with a USA educated Indian national engineer who was much more company focused. The new plant manager was tasked with saving Union Carbide as much money as possible and was answerable to a financial controller. Union Carbide was looking into every avenue to rid themselves of the plant. One idea was to dismantle the whole operation and send it to South America. However, this was quickly abandoned as the plant showed signs of corrosion at several points. The story only gets worse as throughout 1983 pressure was increased to make cuts and since as much staff as possible had been laid off the next thing to target was unsurprisingly maintenance. Stainless steel parts were replaced with cheaper regular steel and safety check intervals were doubled. Instruments as they failed weren't replaced. The company was really sweating the assets to beyond what would be considered safe. As we saw with Tokaimura, major changes to processes were brought in and modifications to methods led to a more hazardous working environment. Disaster by this point was guaranteed. Before we get onto that, let's have a quick look at the process used in the plant for the manufacture of Seven. 
Seven manufacturer is a fairly cheap process and involves direct reaction of MIC with one naphthol. MIC was manufactured at Bhopal by reacting mephalamine and phosgene. Both chemicals are colourless gases and the resultant MIC was then used to make seven. The MIC needed to be stored after its manufacturer at the MIC plant on site. Three underground 68,000 litre tanks numbered E610, E611 and E619 were provided. In normal operation, two of the three tanks were used to store MIC of good quality and the final tank was used to store rejected product for reprocessing later. Each tank had a diameter of 240 centimeters and a length of 1200 centimeters. From the plant to the tanks runs a common stainless steel line which branches off to each individual tank. Discharges from safety relief valves from each individual tank is taken to a common relief vent valve header. The RVVH was used to vent excess toxic gases to a vent gas scrubber. A rupture disc was provided at the end of the RVVH line to break at 40 psi. Once broken, the gases would make their way to the scrubber. The MIC was stored under a pressure from high purity nitrogen gas. This was provided by a common header made of steel. Nitrogen was needed to prevent MIC from being exposed to moisture. Excess nitrogen was taken to a common process vent header, PVH, made of steel and also sent to the vent gas scrubber. The reason why MIC couldn't be exposed to moisture was because of the risk of an exothermic reaction. Once the scrubber had processed the gases, it was sent to a flare tower for burning. Up until 1984, the RVVH and PVH were kept separate. However, it was decided in May by management that a connection between the two would help in the case of either valve being out of operation for maintenance. A jumper line between the two was used. Bizarrely but unsurprisingly, safety audits of Union Carbide plants in the US and Europe were undertaken yearly. However, elsewhere in the world only received one every two years. In May 1982, one such of these audits was undertaken at Bhopal. And the results were a worrying sign of things to come. Worker performance was below that of their American counterparts, mainly due to a high turnover of untrained staff, and 10 major concerns were highlighted. It was also found that safety equipment, alarms and instruments were poorly maintained and not regularly tested. An action plan was written but never followed up. Mid-1984, after a visit to Bhopal, a senior engineer reported to UCC that what he had saw at the plant was worrying. However, again, unsurprisingly, this was not followed up. Bhopal's design was based on US plants, one such situated in Virginia. In September 1984, an internal UCC report highlighted a risk of a runaway reaction in the MIC storage tanks due to a number of defects. Moreover, response plans were not effective enough to prevent a catastrophic failure. Surprise, surprise, the report was never forwarded to Bhopal. By 1984, multiple safety systems had either failed or were not in use, including the vent gas scrubber. Pipelines and parts of the storage tanks were corroded to a dangerous degree. On the 3rd of December, tank 610 contained around 42 tonnes of MIC. Bearing in mind that the tanks were meant to be kept under pressure, the unmaintained meters showed abnormally low PSI levels. Several days before, attempts were made to try and pressurise tank 610 to allow the transfer of MIC to the 7 plant. However, these failed. At 8.30pm on the 2nd of December, operators began to clean pipelines by inserting a hose into the system. During this operation, a slip line to stop water from getting into the tank was not used. Some water managed to make its way into tank 610, and at around 10pm an exothermic reaction began. The reaction was exasperated by contamination in the poorly maintained pipework. After a shift change, the pressure in the tank was recorded at 10.30 at 2 psi. However, no temperature was recorded. The pressure over the next hour would gradually rise to 10 psi. However, this increase was put down to a malfunctioning gauge. This assumption would be wrong, however, as the increase in pressure was hinting at something much more deadly. 
At 11.30pm, several workers near the vent gas scrubbers started to feel the first effects of exposure of MIC via irritation to their eyes. Workers began to search the structure for a leak. MIC and water were found coming out of a branch of the RVVH, where the safety valve had been removed and the open pipe had been blocked off. The leak was reported around midnight and bizarrely the supervisor decided that the operators should spray water at the tank and that no further action should be taken until after a tea break. Other workers were ordered to look for any other leaks during the break. Not long after the tea break, at around 12.30 in the morning, the reaction in tank E610 reached a critical state, pushing pressure to 40 psi, causing a noticeable rumbling from within. Concrete started to crack around the tank's emergency relief valve as it began to fail. The pressure indicator of the tank in the control room was now showing a reading off the scale at 55 psi at 25 degrees centigrade. An alarm was sounded to alert the rest of the plant to a leak. Over the next 10 to 20 minutes, the alarm was suppressed. At around 1 a.m., water was sprayed onto the vent gas scrubber structure to try and reduce the amount of gases being vented to atmosphere. However, lack of water pressure meant that the stream couldn't reach the height of the leak. Water was also sprayed on the storage tank mounds and pipes from tank 610 to the VGS. The gas was being vented to atmosphere. As it contacted the cold air, it condensed and started slowly to rain down on the local area to the southeast of the plant, only to be evaporated again, spreading further into the residential areas. At around 1.30 a.m., several workers had fled the plant. After this point, the safety valve on tank 610 reset, indicating a drop in pressure and an end to the uncontrolled release of MIC. Just after 2am, the public siren sounded. Tank 610 was warm to the touch, and several pressure and temperature gauges were damaged, giving an indication of the intense reaction that had taken place. In total, around 40 tonnes of MIC had been released to atmosphere, condensing and falling onto the earth around the densely populated streets of Bhopal. The cloud that engulfed the town was not solely made up of MIC, but instead a cocktail of various deadly chemicals. Some of them included chloroform, carbon dioxide and hydrogen chloride, as well as many other elements. Much of the cloud was denser than air, causing it to hug closely to the ground, permeating its way into the densely populated slums. Many houses of which had their doors open as residents woken up by the siren went outside to investigate the commotion. Immediately after Union Carbide informed the authorities at around 3am, the state and Indian governments began to provide assistance. However, by this time, reports of fatalities had already been given to the police. At around 6am, the police took to the streets with loudspeakers mounted on cars, saying, Something has gone wrong somewhere. Everything is normal now. Citizens are requested to return to their homes. This wasn't much help to residents of the window and doorless Kutcher houses, where many of the owners of these properties died in their sleep. In the commotion, many residents fled their homes, some in cars, but the majority on foot or bicycle. This would be a factor in the number of casualties, as out in the open, the risk of ingestion of the chemicals was greatly increased. The cloud's effects on the human body started off with burning eyes, followed by vomiting, and eventually, as the gases made their way inside the lungs, trouble breathing and a burning sensation in the throat. Many people ran in the same direction of the cloud, exposing themselves further to deadly levels. Popal train station was in the affected area. During the night, the station was busy with travellers, homeless and gypsies, many of whom were found dead by the morning. In the cold light of the morning sun, every cow, goat, cat, dog and buffalo around the plant lay dead. In the immediate vicinity, human bodies lay lifeless both inside and outside of their homes. And within a few days, all the grass had turned yellow and the trees had lost their leaves. On the 4th of December, the police started collecting the bodies and dumped them into the river. A proper count of victims was never really undertaken. During the initial days, residents from around the city rushed to help in any way they could many using their own vehicles to help to transport the injured to hospitals and to remove the dead, at some risk to their own lives. 
The hospitals after the leak were swamped with blinded, foaming at the mouth and gasping for breath patients, many of whom had toxic chemicals embedded into their clothes and hair, spreading the effects to many healthcare workers. Around 170,000 people, 14,000 of which were severely injured, were treated in hospitals around Bhopal and Madhya Pradesh. Many were treated outside buildings due to the overflow of people. Medical students, doctors, paramedics and nurses all helped with treating the wounded. Even more medical professionals from the rest of the country and even internationally either attended at Bhopal or offered specialised advice to the humanitarian effort. UCC's chairman and CEO Warren Anderson visited India in the aftermath of the leakage. However, he was placed under house arrest and urged to leave the country. UCC organised a healthcare team to provide assistance to the overstretched local medical community. The MIC was believed to remain in the atmosphere for several weeks and because of this the number of the wider population affected is largely unknown. Five kilometres away from the affected area a mass grave for the rotting animal carcasses was dug and lined with lime and salt to try and reduce the risk of contaminating the ground. All throughout this time the bodies of the victims were either burnt in funeral pyres or buried in mass graves. Many dead went unidentified including children. There are some harrowing photos of the victims and the amount of suffering is truly horrible to see. This brings us on to Operation Faith. After investigations into the status of the Union Carbide plant, it was discovered that several more tonnes of MIC were still stored at the site in Tank 611. It was decided that the best way to rid of the potential second disaster was to power up the 7 plant to convert the MIC. December the 16th was decided to enact Operation Faith, however before the plan could be put into action, some remedial repairs had to be made to the safety systems at the plant. All staff were retrained for the operation and an alarm system was set up in case of a leak. The government set out to evacuate around 80,000 people nearest the facility. However many were untrusting of the government and decided to leave the town completely, opting not to use the official evacuation point. In total, 22 tonnes of MIC were converted to 7 under Operation Faith. In March 1985, the Indian government passed the Bhopal Gas Act, allowing legal action to be brought against UCC. After several years of litigation in both the US and India, resulted in an out-of-court settlement of $470 million in November 1989. In 2010, seven Indian nationals were charged and convicted of causing death by negligence and were each sentenced to two years and a fine of 100,000 rupees. In 2006, the Indian government claimed a total of 700,000 people affected by the MIC leak. It is thought between 3 and 16,000 people died as a result, with around 550,000 more injured and around 38,000 with temporary partial injuries and nearly 4,000 permanent injuries. Even today the long term effects are felt with higher than average levels of birth defects and chronic illnesses including cancer and tuberculosis. The community of Bhopal still feel the emotional pain of the disaster and the sorrow runs deep. The factory closed down in 1986 and after anything of value was sold off, the site has been left pretty much to rust away. Tragic is not a strong enough word to describe the Bhopal disaster. Even for a channel like this that pretty much only covers massive industrial disasters, I'm shocked at the carnage that was rained down on the city. Now for me this is a longer video, however it barely scratches the surface of the disaster. I highly recommend reading number 2 and 3 in my sources section as both reports give an almost minute by minute breakdown of the event as it unfolded. Also check out this book, Five Past Midnight in Bhopal, it is well worth a read. Now what do you think? Could an industrial disaster on this scale happen again? Sadly, I think it really could. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed the video, and all that's left to say is thank you for watching.